Daniel Kluge is a senior policy advisor for the Australian government, currently working on developing future-focused policy and the next long-term strategy for Australia's $152 billion visitor economy. Daniel is a passionate advocate for regenerative tourism initiatives and believes that the sector can create value and support local communities economically while helping to preserve our iconic natural environments. So thanks everybody and um, thanks for having me. Um, I, as, as um, Morris mentioned, I work with um, Austrade in, in sustainable tourism policy uh, as well as um, what we like to call the visitor economy, which is sort of much broader than just tourism and in, in, encapsulates anyone that is services visitors um, or um, is, is of service to visitors, so um, or visiting destinations. So visitor economy looks at um, international education visitors, people that are here for work, business events, um, tourism and leisure, um, all sorts. And, and so that's some of the work that, um, that Australia leads there. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about best practice in sustainable destination development. I've, I've started a, the slide with a really great example um, from a colleague of mine who works on a, another sort of passion project um, called the Yarra Pools Project, which is um, the work of looking at destination development as a way of increasing livability and activating spaces. So uh, this is a proposal that they've got uh, for Melbourne and on the Yarra on the Yarra River there. And um, the idea is that, you know, swimmable lakes are healthy lakes. And that idea of being able, the best way to showcase that is having something that um, uses natural waterways, uses natural filtration devices and creates a reason to visit. You know, very similar, I'm based in Brisbane and um, you've got the um, South Bank is, you know, a similar example of, of being able to activate spaces through pools things i might actually i've forgotten as well i should probably acknowledge the traditional owners on, on the lands that we meet today um i'm here like i said in, in brisbane um, with the Turrbal and yarraga people um and i extend my um thanks and my recognition to elders past present and emerging so sorry about that so a bit of my background before we get started, I was in a hotelier turned consultant. So I was in the hotel and tourism industry from a business perspective. I really enjoyed the industry and, and, and just find it such a great place to work uh, and then moved into public policy, um, sort of working on that other level for government and um, trying to drive destination development, visitation to, to areas and really using sort of tourism for, for good. Um, a lot of that I did through my role at EarthCheck as one of the project managers there. We did a lot of great destination development strategies and looking at destinations, um, whether it's regional councils, um, locations, islands, um, you know, Threadbow, for example, you know, that wanted to really, you know, showcase what they were doing sustainably in terms of how to manage what can be seen as, as quite a negative effect on the natural environment, which is over tourism and unsustainable tourism practices and showcasing, you know, what can be done in terms of bringing people in on that journey and, and really in using tourism as a force for good. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about that today and um, what you can do, what governments can do and, and what we can all sort of do together and how it all comes together and sort of best practice examples. Um, I've been volunteering with Thrive since around June this year. Um, Morgan Morris, but I'd really like to get into it a little bit more next year because I really value what uh, that you do um, and your reach and, and the potential of, of the organisation. So I'll be ticking off a little bit about what destination development is and, and what it is to me and, and how I've sort of worked through it in my career, um, how it contributes to the sustainable development goals um, and, and, you know, that link between thrivability or sustainability and destination development when it's done properly. Um, some best practice examples and some cautionary tales. So um, there, there's some really great examples in Australia and abroad of, of destinations that have really elevated themselves. Um, but there's also some, you know, words of caution of growing too fast or, or not having a plan in place. Um, I'll leave you with some key takeaways and then happy to do Q&A at the end if anyone's um, got some interest there. So I'll start with this because this was something that through my years as a, as a consultant um, and doing these kind of destination development workshops with, with locals and communities, it's something that came up a lot and you've probably all heard it, build it and they will come. 
Um, I personally really hate the phrase and I just don't think it really encapsulates what we need to do and, and how to do things strategically and, and all the elements that come into, you know, good destination development. It's sort of a, you know, I guess a phrase that's come out of maybe the 80s when, when tourism was about the big banana or the big prawn and, and going to see a big plastic thing on your way driving through town to another one. But ultimately, I mean, there was no revenue generating activities. You weren't creating areas to give back to towns. It was focused on a lot of um, foot traffic or, or um, you know, car traffic. So it's not really a, um, a sustainable or, or a smart way of doing things when you're looking about building your destination. Um, it really puts all your eggs in one basket and means that you have to put in a lot of capital and a lot of investment early on um, and not know where you're going to end up. Um, so what I like to see more, and I think is a, is a better phrase, is sort of building identity um, and they will come. Destination development really takes, you have to take an inward look of what you are as, as a destination, whether you're, you know, an island or you're a city or you're a, um, yeah, even a community, a suburb can, can do really good destination development. You have to think, you, you know, West End, for example, um, their identity and their culture was that bohemian sort of lifestyle and that, that idea of counterculture being their culture and then building off that to create something um, really, really special. So, I mean, destination development at its core is about creating reasons to visit. So why would you go to a destination? Why, why have you chosen this destination over all others? Why have you chosen to, to come and, and spend your time, spend your money um, in, in these destinations? Um, increasing livability is also really important. So tourism infrastructure development sometimes has a negative rap, particularly around people and communities, because it's often uh, public investment uh, that doesn't have a, a, an immediate focus on the people that live in the towns. So the idea of uh, people that might have to pay council rates uh, for something that isn't of their benefit is, is causes that issue. So creating good destination development, good tourism infrastructure is about developing those destinations with benefits for both um, communities and, and visitors to communities. You know, happy communities are, are really thriving communities. Um, Championing your destination's central ethos, that was the identity I'm talking about earlier, the culture and what makes it unique. So you really have to look at, at yourself and, and, and look at where you live or where you'd like to travel and, you know, what, what makes that so special? You know, ultimately it's not the hotel, but the hotel can tie into that ethos. Um, alignment to sustainable development goals. I know that today is about partnership for the goals um, and peace and justice. So I'll put that in there. I mean. Partnership is really important, whether it's partnerships and collaboration at a destination level, but also partnership as, as visitors. You know, we have a responsibility to travel sustainably and to really provide that economic input where it, where it's needed. And, and that might be by, you know, buying local honey from the, the corner store that, that produces it there or going and, and to, doing a cruise and, and doing an experience rather than just um, coming to a town and and, you know, lying on the beach and, and not sort of engaging with the destination. That's that's sort of about how we punch and how we sustainably give that uh, economic value to the people that need it, which are the ones that are sort of accepting you into their house or into their destination. So first example I want to talk about, um, this is a really great one, um, is Blue Derby in Tasmania. So Blue Derby was a traditional town that focused on logging and agriculture and, and um, some of these industries that were in cyclical de decline uh, they were closing down the, the lifeblood of the, of the town was, was really starting to deteriorate people were leaving particularly young people looking to cities like Hobart or abroad to to have a viable career to start a family and, and to spread out because they, they felt as though their town was sort of a little bit um, yeah behind the times or didn't have that economic value of being able to stay um, what they did is they looked at what they, uh, their destination, what made them unique, and they did know that, you know, they're in iconic rainforests, world heritage areas, these, you know, thousands of year old trees and forests and that beautiful surrounding. And, and this is something that people come to the town that, that um, can experience it. But what they tied it into was 
the growth in, in cycle tourism and in particular mountain bike tourism and started to investigate trail infrastructure. Um, and over the course of about 10 years, they invested more than 80 kilometres of purpose-built mountain biking trails that sort of wove its way through the environment. Again, the way that they did it was so it wasn't going to cause erosion and, and issues, but it created that idea of being able to experience nature and be really there in nature and, and commercialise it as well. And that sort of conservation through commercialisation is, is, is really important in these sort of areas. Um, I mean, what happened to the town, it went from nothing to almost 30,000 visitors every year. Um, and with a return of investment of the, of the development of, of 30 million per year. Um, so that's a huge, and I don't know if you've ever been, I've been personally, um, the life is really back in the town. There's not only the mountain bikers that come, but they stay for multiple days. They'll spend, there's money on, you know, bike repair shops, food and beverage outlets, other areas and other things to do, events um, throughout the year. And it creates that's a sustainable um, revenue generation from, from tourism, from people coming. And another thing to, to notice is, I guess, to stand out on a global stage as a premier mountain biking area or, or a premier for anything is really quite remarkable. Getting people to willing to jump on a plane to come to your destination in order to experience it. So um, I just think it's a great, it's a great example. Um, the caveat with that is it didn't happen overnight. And again, it wasn't that build it and they will come. They really did a lot of background research into the policy behind it and, and what may, you know, what the viability and the feasibility was going to be. So you can see here from this, um, I guess, timeline of the events, they really started thinking about it in terms of a destination trail strategy for Tasmania in 2002. And it wasn't until 2015 that they were able to open their first um, stage. Also, there were market leaders and there were sort of um, uh, forward thinkers with, with this as well. So there's a few other destinations that come up and try to steal market share, but being first to market, um, they were able to really sort of uh, leverage the benefits um, of, of that sort of long-term investment. Another example I'd like to use, um, this is another a uh, project that I worked with back with um, Earthcheck, but I've kept in contact and, and seen how they've grown as a destination since, um, is Phillip Island of Victoria. So I'm not sure if there's any Victorians on the line, but um, Phillip Island is really interesting. I mean, it's a, it's a little ecosystem in itself. Uh, it's known for uh, having the, the Penguin Parade and iconic beaches and, and nature reserves. But it's also on the flip side, it's known for the um, Moto GP, like a huge motorcycle racing event. Um, so that sort of mix between sort of your rev head culture and conservation culture in those two different tourists um, is, is a really interesting mix. But the thing with uh, Phillip Island is that they're actually really susceptible to, to the threat of over tourism as, as a destination. There's one um, there's one bridge in and out of, of the island and um, they have one of the highest visitor to ratio, visitor to resident ratios in the world. So 80 visitors for every one resident in the, in the peak season, which is around those sort of summer months. Um, this also causes the thing that um, we call in, in tourism seasonality, which is that idea of getting these spikes of visitors. So, um, you know, destinations, beaches, for example, could, you know, going to, to Noosa, you have 80% of your visitors coming over a couple of weekends of the year and then in the, in the winter months, nothing at all. And so it means that businesses can't hire staff all year round. They might be just looking for summer casuals. Um, they can't have, um, you get overloaded infrastructure because you're trying to uh, have your roads and your accommodation that is big enough for the, for the spikes, but um, not going to sit there dormant and, and a waste of time in, in the afternoon. And it's also, you know, quite stressful on the environment. If you look at penguin parades and um, you, the, the effects of people trampling on, on, on nature and that kind of thing. So it is a real threat in the industry and um, threat for Australia. I guess we haven't seen it as much as, as Europe and some of those more developed destinations because we're, we are growing um, and we're not as, we're, we've got much more space and, and areas. But there's definitely areas that have that over tourism side of things. Byron Bay is another, another good example recently. Um, so what they decided to do is they, 
decided on a, a 20 year visitor economy strategy for the region. So that that's almost unheard of in terms of destination development, looking that far ahead. Um, most destinations do a three or a four year cycle, you know, often aligned with the political cycles. Um, you know, Australia's just gone out with their draft uh, um, destination development strategy, which is a 10 year, so a long term 10 year strategy, and, and some of the other destinations and, and countries follow suit. You know, Norway's got one as well, and, and that seems to be a, a way of looking at that long term um, development. But um, Philip Island was definitely one of the market leaders, I think, in terms of doing that. Um, they realized that in order to develop sustainably, they needed to focus on their shoulder season, so not the spikes, um, but trying to re create reasons to visit and and developing a destination management plan that looked at the whole island over the whole course of the year. Um, as a result, uh, the other thing that they identified was sustainability as being crucial to the, their survival um, and being able to have re, really key measurable targets. So you can't change what you can't measure. And so I guess one of the first actions of this strategy when it was implemented was a, a sustainable tourism accord in 2016. Uh, looking at being certified and benchmarked as a destination. So I guess the difference there um, and Thrive does a very similar thing is benchmarking is, is getting those initial me um, measurements. So you go to a doctor and say, oh, I want to lose some weight or I want to be healthier. They have to know where they've come from. So you would, you would weigh yourself and when you go in, um, you check your blood pressure, all of that thing. That's kind of what a destination development strategy does. It checks the blood pressure and pulse checks where you are. And then you check it intermittently every year afterwards and see if it's increased um, or, or declined. So um, they started doing that. They're actually EarthCheck certified um, uh, recently. Um, and then as of the last data that we have, sort of pre-COVID, uh, tourism was estimated at being worth 520, uh, 29 million. Um, so it's up 43.9%, which is a huge amount. Um, but it's that idea of being able to grow without being able to go over that cap and, and just putting all their eggs in one basket over the summer period. Uh, things that they, they did as part of that, there was a, a focus on events, um, surfing events, and, and looking at some other ways of, of developing the culture of, of the island as being an iconic sort of culture, uh, surfing reserve, um, as well as looking at uh, ways of, of sort of yeah, managing sustainability, whether it's visitor caps or, or uh, you know, promotions and, and marketing in, in traditionally off-peak periods to grow those and sort of flatten out that seasonality curve. Uh, the last one I wanted to talk to you about before I go into some, I guess, some more direct things that we, we can do as, as um, community and, and as um, consumers is, is Leipzig in Germany. Um, I like this one because it is a real cool destination. Um, it, they sort of have this this idea of being the new Berlin, so it's um, a really hip path and, and and really sort of vibrant town and a really great destination. But it wasn't always like that. Um, in nineteen ninety eight, sort of you know in that almost eight, eight years or so since the fall of Berlin Wall, and it was in, in the East German section, um, they only had 47, 437,000 residents. So this was uh, almost halved in terms of what they were at their peak. Um, ultimately, the, the town was, was known for really high um, pollution industries, manufacturing, coal, um, and, and that sort of, you know, real warehouse vibe of, of being able to um, a sort of an outdated model of, of how you would do. So it wasn't a very nice place to live. Um, a lot, as a result, a lot of the young people were leaving um, to more, you know, deemed uh, more vibrant destinations, whether it was, you know, Hamburg or, or Berlin. Um, I guess the solution, this solution, there was a strategy, again, a 10 year strategy looking at um, the sustainable urban development of, of the city and, and looking at what makes them unique. But a lot of this was actually community led. So as people were leaving and, and uh, some of these traditional, you know, uh, East German industries were shutting down, uh, artists moved into these um, giant warehouses. So similar to, you know, early days of, of New York or, or Berlin, 
the idea that um, cheap rent brought in a bohemian crowd and, and, and young people looking to to really branch out and, and have somewhere that they could su sustain their sort of artistic endeavours. Um, they used the um, the open warehouses for, for art spaces as, as um, collab spaces and, and started to really bring that culture in. And Leipzig has, has sort of leaned into that culture and, and looked at what their communities need and, and started to look at, you know, being a, a real accessible city and having more accommodations sort of in that inner ring and uh, an investment in, in bike paths and things like that to really sort of connect the city and, and be that thriving sort of destination that focuses on um, being car free or being um, being able to get around and, and walkable. Um, so through that investment, I mean, after the result today, I mean, it's one of the most popular tourist destinations. So it's been from virtually unknown to being a real sort of spot on, on the map. Um, some clever marketing as well as, as seeing it as not Leipzig, but Heipzig and, you know, coming and see the hype and, and, and the new Berlin of the people wanting to see what the next big thing is. Um, they've really harnessed that gentrification as a way of, of growing their destination and make it a, a really creating these reasons to visit ultimately. Um, so I really like that. There's another example that I use sometimes as well um, with Portland. Um, their big thing was a community-led initiative, which was Keep Portland and Weird. So they were a weird town and they had a lot of arts and, again, a lot of vacant churches and things like that and, and uh, you know, a real sort of interesting bohemian scene. And they lent into that with this Keep Portland and Weird campaign. And then suddenly people thought, you know, weird is actually quite cool. I want to go be part of the weirdos in, in Portland and, and grow. And, and this fashion went from sort of virtually unknown again to, you know, in one of the top city, livable cities um, in the US and, and one of those sort of key places that you want to go and see. I don't know if anyone's seen Portlandia, but that idea of, you know, ridiculous hipster culture and, and, and leaning into your almond lattes and things like that is, is something that they've really leveraged. and. Um, to great effect. But it doesn't always go to plan. I think this is the last one I wanted to talk about um, in terms of Iceland. So similar situation. Um, Iceland was in economic decline and they didn't do well out of the global financial crisis. There was also um, uh, some issues with um, uh, ash clouds and, and things like that that really made it a, a a destination which was struggling to get tourists and struggling to get sort of any sort of economies of scale coming up. But um, what this also did was um, it reduced the, the value of their currency. So it suddenly became a really affordable destination, for places like the Great Britain, the US to come and visit. Um, and so they lent into this idea of well, what is our culture? You know, what are we, what makes us unique? And they said, well, it's, it's our natural environment. It's our beautiful glaciers. It's our welcoming people. And this sort of, slightly weird, you know, Sigur Rós style of, of um, what it is to be a Nordic country or being in Iceland. Um, it was a hugely valuable campaign and it was a really big idea. And I don't know if many of you have seen Iceland now, that idea of Iceland being the next thing to do, but um, tourism just exploded and people just went ballistic, um, which was great. I mean, really, really valuable. But the negative effects from that is that... Um, growing unsustainably without that sort of strategy and not being able to understand just how many tourists were going to come and how to, to house them, meant they were playing catch up in terms of trying to really convert that visitor and all the money that they come um, wanting to spend in the town to being able to inject that, that and give that reason to visit and the reason to spend money in the town there um, and do it sustainably. So Airbnb took over being, you know, an, an agile startup and, and quite easy to to grow and scale in terms of not needing capital investment. Um, Airbnbs took over and this caused a rental crisis. So there was, um, and there's similar things happening in Australia now, I guess in COVID, one of the risks of um, uh, property prices going up regionally is that there's not so many places to, um, uh, for people to stay and workers to work in, in the regions um, because it's all there, because it's such a, a lucrative idea of being able to get um, visitors there. Um, in terms of the gentrification, it was happening very quickly and to, to be able to handle with not having sort of a global strategy of how to bring in those tourists, they started offering ways to make it easy. So English menus, um, 
those sort of group guided tours, cruise boat industry, that sort of thing. And that limits the authenticity of the destination. And it, it, it reduces that identity uh, that I talked about earlier. And it starts to be not such a, you know, authentic reason, uh, location to, to visit. And that's sort of the bell curve that happens with, with over tourism. So I guess in a graph, I wanted to bring this as, as quite a good graph um, from a, a source that I saw um, and I like to use it in my presentations, but this idea of growing the number of visitors, you think, you think that the more visitors the destination comes to or the more people to go to a place, the more money they're going to get. But realistically, that's only true to a, to a point um, where people start to grow and grow and, and suddenly um, your destination is bursting at the, scene, at the seams. Um, there's, it's harder to get a park, harder to get a, a restaurant booking. Um, things start to be really sort of homogenised in terms of the, to the delivery and the authenticity diminishes. Um, once that starts to happen, the, the high value tourists or the early adopters that, that came to your destination to begin with um, start to leave. So you might think of people that go to Cinque Terre, for example, or, or something like that. And they, and you go, and you know, well, who are all these people? I don't, I don't like this. I'm not going to go here. I'm going to go somewhere less populated. Um, and that's when you start to lose out from, there's always going to be people that go, but they might be a cheaper tourist and they might have less, less money to spend. And then you, your high value tourists go elsewhere. And so you start to get all the negative effects, the damage to the environment, the overpopulation without the benefits of, of, of the economic um, revenue that's there. So you're really trying to maximize your spend in the destination and reasons for people to spend money rather than um, not. So. I guess in closing, I know this is very sort of, it's a niche sort of area, but I just think it's, it's really interesting and it's sort of what I've built my career on. Um, I, I love it, but the important thing I want you to take away is this, this destination development is, um, it can be government-led, it can be community-led, um, you, you guys, and, or industry-led, you know, from businesses. But the best is a combination of all three. So I guess if there's one takeaway that I want you to, to all take away with you is that you have a, a really big role to play when you when you travel of, of why you travel and, and what you do in destinations and why they're unique and really leaning into sort of supporting destinations that that sort of support you in terms of your personal beliefs um and you hopefully spend money accordingly and, uh, and really support these businesses that are trying to survive particularly COVID has seen such a huge drop in, in visitor numbers and visitor spend all across the world these businesses are really struggling, so they really need your your support. Um, so, I guess the key things that we, we, you'd want to do, in, in the best case scenario, is, is be strategic. Um, if you are a destination, or if you are part of this idea of wanting to bring more people to your town, is, is um, find your unique selling points and, and really work out how you're going to get there. Um, Create a unified vision and make sure that you bring everyone along on the journey. So engage all your stakeholders, your business, uh, your government, your um, your community, your friends, your, your family, because it's, it's much more effective. If you're all singing from the same song sheet in terms of what you what you do. Um, invest for the long term. Don't look for the quick fix. Don't look for the eccentric billionaire. You know, you're putting all of that. Um, risk but also all of that control onto to one thing it, it is a big gamble so you're really sort of uh, a rising tide uh, floats all boats and we you know we can do more together than some of our parts so i think that's what i want to uh, stress here um, and embed sustainability i mean it's a given for a group like this in, embed it from the start make sure you always track where you come from and track this process and grow sustainably because um, ultimately that's the best way to have strong foundations to really thrive in the future. Um, things that you shouldn't do, uh, as I mentioned, don't rely on the eccentric billionaire. So, I mean, everyone has sort of Mona in Tasmania with David Walsh. I mean, that's an exception to the rule. That has really exploded Tasmania and, and Hobart as being this really great cool art capital. But not everywhere has, has a billionaire willing to, to put all that capital investment into something that they they want to do so um don't just look for for government or um for an individual to to fund something that's going to bring people to your town i think it, it's a team effort and it, 
a few little, uh, you know, a, a series of, of smaller initiatives is, is more powerful than just one big, you know, shot of the dark. Um, don't forget about your community. Always make sure that you, you know, in, in government we consult a lot and we always try to listen and we always try to hear what's going on because, you know, ultimately you're the, the grassroots, you're on the ground, you can experience where you're from and, and you, you know what's happening. And so it, that's what we really draw good policy from. Um, and don't only seek to increase visitation. So you may think that, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had triple the number of visitors here in, in summer? Yes, but wouldn't it be even better if you only had, you know, 50% more visitors, but they spent four times as much. So suddenly you've got all of this value coming in from people spending money and, and really giving back to your community uh, without the need to, to house triple or quadruple the number of tourists. Um, and, and the other thing, as I mentioned before, don't forget to benchmark. So really understand, even at the beginning of your journey, um, what your measurements are. And I think this goes for any industry. You know, really understand what, um, where you've started so that you know where, you, you, where you're getting to and, and where, how far you've come. Um, it's also really valuable for, for um, showing your, your progress and then really sort of celebrating those wins, um, which is, I think, something that we can do with Thrive as well. So that's it for me. Um, I'd love to take some some questions. I think the the other thing I wanted to say about destination development and, and tourism in, in more general is, is it's up to all of us. And I really hope that um, you guys, when you think about your travel, and, and I know that it's hard, but once the destinations are opening up, really get out there and, and experience things and, and maybe spend money as, as though you were going on a holidays trip, uh, an overseas trip, spend it in, in your Australian economy. I think it's a, a really great opportunity to, to see all these great things that people come to visit us to experience, but experiencing them as locals sort of holidaying in your own backyard. Thanks very much.